super excited today to be joined by the wonderful Rin Hamburg of Rin Hamburg and Co. Hello, Rin. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us on Beyond the Hashtag. Very nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, for our wonderful listeners, give us a bit of background about Rin Hamburg and Co. and the amazing work that you do and how long you've been in business and a bit about your journey. Cool. Okay. The nutshell version. So um, I actually um, have never worked in an agency and I've never worked client side. So I started my career as a journalist, um, which I think actually was very helpful because I think it has been the foundation of growing this business. So I run a copywriting agency called Rin Amber Co. We've been going for five and a half years. Um, uh, there's a team of nine of us. Um, and yeah, we were t- chatting just before wow. this. We've just got our first premises, which is very exciting. That's so exciting. Um, yeah, so so kind of in a nutshell, what we do is, um, you know, because obviously copywriting is quite broad and it includes lots of different things. So where we specialize is what we work with what we call expert led businesses. So it's not necessarily one particularly industry vertical. We work with tech and healthcare and sustainability and B2B services. But all of our clients have something in common, which is that they want to be seen as experts in their field. So often they've either been around for a long time or they might be in the startup world, but their founders are very experienced. So there's that kind of expertise in their heads. Yeah. And then what we do is we help them to, first of all, clarify and communicate their messaging. So what is it that they're trying to say about themselves? Um, and then we use blogging, white papers, other content to kind of help them just, just stamp their authority in their industry. So the expertise that's in their head, it's like, how can we get that out, get it into actual words on paper so they can start sharing it? I love that. What And what a challenging I'm probably very, I must assume, very rewarding vertical kind of area to focus in on because that's that's really challenging, right? Is is, is kind of meeting an ex, um, a thought leader or a business founder, getting their expertise out of their head and putting that into content. Like how many times have you kind of just been given like, the smallest of briefs about somebody's knowledge and then you go, like, oh. yeah, so this is, this is why we tend not to just take a brief we're involved in the brief creations process. Great. And I think that my journalism background, I mean, if you think about it, I was working on a daily paper, I'd get into work in the morning and my editor would be like, write an article about this, go out and find two case studies, an expert you can interview, all the statistics, and I need it on my desk by three o'clock. And it's like, right. you got very, so I very quickly had to learn how to become a, a, an instant expert at something and then drop all that the next day because then I need to think about something else. And so the processes that we've created in the business are very much, the writing is almost the second part of it. The first part of it is the account management and drawing that out of people. So often the classic scenario is it's the um, marketing manager, marketing director, marketing lead comes to us and says, here's me in this business. I've got all these subject matter experts um, and I need some help creating content. And then what we do is we kind of come in and we act as that intermediary um, because we can say to the subject matter experts, so tell us about this thing. And then they yeah. do and we're like, okay, you're going to have to tone that down a bit. Or, yeah. And they're not sometimes, because actually in, in B2B, often the audience for the content is already quite um, sophisticated anyway. So we want to, you know, we're not trying to dumb things down. It's more that we have to draw out of it you know, what's interesting to the reader. So the the technical expert is so excited about something that they want to say everything, but actually we just need to focus this one post on this one thing. And the other thing is around um, uh, unconscious competence where somebody is so much of an expert that they kind of don't realise they're an expert. So they assume everyone else is on their level and then they they just talk in a way that people are like, I don't don't get that. My mum's like this with plants. I'll say to mum, you know, can you help me with whatever in the garden? She's like, oh, I don't know about it. But then when you start talking to her, she knows. She does. She just, she doesn't realise she knows. And it's the same with experts across any field. And it's that confidence, isn't it? You know, a lot of people, everyone, in fact, knows a lot of stuff about a lot of things that many other people don't. And it's yeah. actually having that confidence um, to put that message out there and have that voice be heard. And also which, finding the right words for it. Like, yeah. You're an expert in walking, right? You've been doing it since you were little. If I asked you to explain to somebody else who'd never walked how to walk, you'd be like, well, I don't know. You just sort of put one foot in front of another. But yeah. actually, that's not. You, the, there's ways you move your hips or your, your feet, that your toes are involved. And actually, once you, the thing about expertise is it's not, there's their expertise in doing, mm. and then there's the expertise in teaching, mm. and there's the, in articulating and that's what we're experts in we're experts in articulating other people's expertise 
I love that. What great summary. <laughs> love that, Rin. Really. Loved it. <laughs> and, and a team of nine. Yeah. Yes, oh, we had a new data last week. Lovely OMG, number. are they full-time, part-time mix? Like, what's the deal? I think we've got, I think, five of our six part-time. I think it works out to, like, seven full-time equivalent I haven't wow. do you know what the lovely thing is is that my business partner Liz is the numbers lady so I get to be creative and strategic and do the leadershipy stuff which is really nice and then Liz like can give you all the facts so if we ever went on Dragon's Den for anything she'd be the <laughs> one answering those questions about like so what's your net profit margin um I I, I love that and um so for everybody um like listening and for the audience there like Rin and I also met through the NatWest um business accelerator back when it was entrepreneurial spark so all the way back in the day um and I'll always remember Rin saying everybody needs a Liz yeah <laughs> it's true everyone does need a Liz seriously <laughs> I'm so lucky because she started off just working like part-time as my assistant and now she's like operations director and basically runs the show because she's brilliant it's phenomenal it is phenomenal and I have to say um, I concur. Everybody needs their own Liz. Um, when I brought in our business manager, Rachel, things just totally changed. Mm. Totally changed. And it's about recognizing the strengths of individuals in the team and what you're great for. And I always feel like at the top, a why and a how person work, mm. or a why and a what, you know, person and the how work so well together. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. very true. Very, very true. Love that. Um, what do you enjoy mo- most about? running your business I, I I guess I have to say the variety because I was thinking about this and I was thinking it's this no it's this no it's this <laughs> I think it's because it is it is all those things so you know I I really I love my team so I kind of I love our Monday morning team meeting and kind of like chatting to everyone and sort of seeing like seeing them grow and develop as as kind of individuals and in their expertise that's really fun and exciting I'm writing a book at the moment so that's really nice that's kind of capturing all my kind of excitement at the moment wow. because I think I've spent many you know I've, I've been doing this job on and off well sort of I say on and off but in an evolving sort of way from the journalism to, to now I've been writing for other people for near on two decades and so wow. to actually be writing a book that draws on everything that I've done over the last 20 years is, is really really fun but yeah, it is, it's that variety. You know, yesterday going down to the office for the very first time and kind of moving desks around and working out what chairs we need. You know, I wouldn't want to do that as a job, but I love doing it as a moment in my job. So I think totally. that's what I really like. Um, and just also, I, I guess, be, being in charge, not, not being in charge, like I don't like being the boss, that's rubbish. But <laughs> I, I like that I'm kind of in control of my own destiny. You know, if, I mean, whatever we decide, we, yes, I'm, I'm making decisions on the, on the basis of what's good for the business and what's good for the team or the rest of it but essentially nobody can make me do anything and yeah like that is quite independent and stuff and I quite enjoy that <laughs> I love that yeah yeah great great summary um and I, I'm with you those moments where actually like I in my head think like oh we, we've got a new office and oh, where, where can I put people and where can the desks go and I and then I step back and I go oh that's, this is nice I'd like to work here <laughs> yeah. yeah I love exactly. those little moments because they take you away from the day-to-day going like oh numbers and oh paying and, and oh, stress of clients and the clients happy and all that stuff mm. yeah because that's yeah. the flip side isn't it is the responsibility yeah and that's what I was that, gonna say you know, yeah there's eight people whose salaries rely on me doing a really good job um and all of our clients rely on us you know and so every decision I make impacts on so many people um, and there's moments where I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do that this. I don't know if I'm big enough to do that. Yeah. And that, and that self-doubt that you naturally have, you know, in, in moments. And I, you know, I wouldn't say I'm natu- naturally a self-doubting person. I'm, I'm fairly confident. I think I've been through an awful lot in my time. It's a useful thing about being in my early 40s now is I don't feel, I think if I'd been trying to do this in my 20s, I, I don't think I could have done it. Not, not just because of my lack of knowledge and experience, but just in personality, sort of being yeah. a lot more fearful. I'm a lot more fearless than I used to be, which is great. But there is still that thing, you know, you know, hiring new people and you think, are they going to work out? Are they going to be the right fit? You know, is there going to be a a drama between people or or just having to constantly future plan as well? So thinking, you know, okay, what if that person leaves in six months? What if that person leaves in a year? How am I going to make sure that 
you know, because especially with, you know, I know not nine feels big to me, but actually it's still re- really small. Every single person in the business is like really, really essential. Yeah. So if any of them go, I need to know what, you know. What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. Is that the bit that you enjoy least then, the future planning, would you say, or are there other bits that you genuinely hate about running a business? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I suppose one of the things is that as I've started to, I say started to, I've, I've, I've had to do a lot of it, uh, delegating and kind of passing more and more on to other people. What I love about that is that you see other people coming into their own, um, which is really great. And you realise that sometimes they're better than you. So there's like people in my team that are better than me at certain things because I've sort of got it to a level and then they've taken it to the next level. Yeah. But then obviously I tend then not to hear about things until they're going wrong. So there's like yeah. loads of good things happening that you don't necessarily always hear about. And then something goes, goes wrong. I'm like, oh no. So there's, there's a degree of firefighting involved, I think, with being in sort of senior leadership. But um, but no, I don't think there's anything I, I sort of, I hate really. There's, not, there's nothing about the business. And I, I think I've actually very deliberately created a business like that. In the past, we've worked with clients that we really didn't enjoy working with. So now we don't work with those types of clients. You know, we I can tell on a sales call if somebody's going to be one of those clients. And I'm like, nope no so great piece of advice and I think that is um a good lesson learned and a lot of courage taken to get to the point when you absolutely say no not for us yeah nope not for me um yeah and I think like yeah I I use the word hate there probably incorrectly it's enjoy the least about running a business you know there's things that I absolutely love there's things that I look at and go oh that's my job and I don't like Mm. it yeah I think managing I'm not very good manager I think I'm a good leader yeah I think I'm good at sort of going in there and you know geeing up the troops and you know setting the vision and all that kind of stuff that's great but actually like what should people do on a day-to-day basis and what are their KPIs and have they met the target I don't know because I I've (laughs) never really been managed you know I've worked in in my like I said almost 20-year career I've spent 12 of them working for myself so I do everything kind of by instinct. And that's been an interesting part of the last probably year, year and a half, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, is kind of codifying what I do. So I've been trying to work out, okay, how can I take my brain and put it all down on paper, whether that is processes. So, you know, last year we got um, a sales and marketing manager. So, so she's kind of taking over more of the sales stuff, which is great. But how do I do a sales call? I don't know. So I've had to sit down and work out, okay, well, yeah. this, is, this is how I approach sales here's our sales kind of philosophy, our approach to it, because we don't have a heavy sales culture. So it was kind of wanting to make sure that that is passed on, you know, whilst obviously letting people do their thing and, and yeah. sort of facilitating people being themselves and being great, but also kind of saying, okay, here's how I do it. So that's been an interesting process over the last 12 to 18 months. Oh, God, I'm glad it's not just me because I'm exactly the same as you going like, how do we make sure that the essence of naturally social and how we do things is passed on without stifling individuality yeah. and ownership over projects. You know, we don't want to create a team that's just like waiting to be told every day, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. But we need to make sure that there's processes in place that ensure the integrity of the company and how things are being delivered yeah. maintains that level of, of, you know, that standard, I guess. Um, uh, so we've, we've been creating playbooks. So I wrote cool. our blogging playbook, which is everything I know about blogging that our account managers need to know about doing that job. And then I've written a, a sales one um, and we'll do another one that is more about account management. So slightly separately to account management generally um, and website one. So yeah, that's something that we're building at, at the moment as an internal tool, but as I said, I'm also creating a book. So there's a, a degree of crossover. That's and actually I, I, there was a, a, a brand I, I uh, know of, um, that actually they, they went through a relaunch and a rebrand and they published their playbook online cool. as like a wiki for everyone to see. And I was like, Wicked. that is incredibly brave, but I think very clever move. They've been just been really transparent about their business um, because, you know, you can put a step-by-step instruction guide for how to be the best agency in the world. It doesn't mean somebody else is going to be able to do it. No, exactly that. And that's where a lot of these, um, a lot of these, a lot of speakers, thought leaders and um, why downloads and, and lead magnets work really well because you can, like you said, give as much. And there will be a percentage of people that can take exactly what you say and deliver it and some. But actually, yeah, nobody's ever going to do it the same as you are doing it. 
And also those people will become your advocates. So I am yeah. a massive fan of a guy called David C. Baker. Um, okay. Who I speak at a Bristol Creative Industries event a couple of years ago, sort of just near the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it was one of those scenarios where I was literally writing down everything he said. It was so like, oh my goodness, you're speaking to me. And then I bought his book, which is called The Business of Expertise, just sitting there on my shelf over there. Cool. Um, and now, you know, I follow him. I listen to his podcast. Um, I, I follow him on LinkedIn. I also talk about him all the time. So yeah. yes, I've never once, I mean, I suppose I paid him $35 for his book, but I've never really given him any money. But actually, I'm such a massive advocate. We're I'm talking about him all the time. And who knows, from that, somebody might then get switched onto his work and, and then go on to pay his, his fees. I can't afford his fees, but maybe one day I'd love to. Yeah, 100%. Um, and just to echo what you are saying about difference in management and leadership, you know, I've been saying that the last... God knows how many months, maybe a year, you know, I kind of turned around to Andy at NatWest Accelerator and I went, you know, what I've learned most about myself over the last year or two is that I don't like managing and I'm not very good at it, but I'm a really good leader and I yeah. think that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, cool. Okay. So, you know, you've grown immensely and you've built this really successful agency and you've got, you know, so much like bright future ahead of you um you know this podcast is called beyond the hashtag it's about social media and its yeah. role past just posting yeah um, but I think it's useful to understand actually to everyone we're talking to like what part does social media play for you in the biz in your business it's it's enormously important it's essential um I, I would say it's it's one of our most important tools. And the, and the reason why I'd say one of is that it sits, it sits in sort of two spaces. There's most of our, most of our business comes through word of mouth in some way or another. Yeah. So it might be a client referral, it might be other agency referral. So obviously the work we do has got to be important as part of that. And the content that we produce is very important as part of that kind of education process and just being kind of showcasing ourselves as, as experts. Obviously that's what we do help other people do. So we yeah. have to be doing it all ourselves. Um, so then networking is really important. So it's like content and networking and social media brings together content and networking. Yes. It's, it, especially, I think social is very different. If you're in, you know, kind of B2C e-commerce, like you're selling, I don't know, mugs, just sort yeah. of mugger, yeah. um, then great. You, you put an advert out. It's really pretty. Somebody goes and buys it. Great. I appreciate there's a lot more to it than that. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to, to minimize B2C um, uh, social. But actually in B2B and especially B2B services is often a much longer sales process. And that sales cycle can be 9, 12, 18 months. Yeah. You've got to stay front of mind. So, yes, you might have met somebody at a networking group once or actually is the case with one of our clients um, at school when I was 14. So wow. you know, this girl who I've known for almost 30 years, um, she's a client. Yes, I first met her at school. But actually, what is it that's actually helped stay in front front of mind? I mean, obviously, we're sort of mates, but but yeah. actually, she's quite far away. It's been social media. She's seen, yeah. you know, the blog posts we've done, the, the awards we've won. That's all gone out on social. So social has been a way of staying front of mind and in front of people and sharing that content. I love that. I um I bagged a client at Butlins once on a <laughs> <laughs> on a Butlins weekend. Nice. And I got talking to this chap um and you know he thought it just absolutely everything you just said there evidenced it you know he followed me on twitter um and probably like three years later yeah. he uh got in touch and said you know we've got this proposition and we're looking for a partner to work with and you know i've been keeping an eye on what you do is there some interest and you know they're one of our biggest clients now brilliant um, yeah we've got a really good job through um, an award ceremony that we went to and I went along with our then sale. Well, she's still our sales marketing assistant. Um, she's just off on maternity at the moment. But we, we went along, went to this thing, and I was, I was probably about three or four years ago. Uh, had you know, had a couple of drinks, had a laugh. It was great, and then yeah, ended up being actually was this this person then moved companies and then took us then to the, this new company. So wow, yeah, you and never like, know when you meet somebody. I, I often find meeting somebody like kind of that face to face connection is a starting point. Yes, but you know what it's like. You meet somebody. Two weeks later, you're not necessarily going to remember who they are, but if you've connected on LinkedIn and if they're posting great content, you maintain what started with a face-to-face, -face, but it, it's built through the content. Exactly. And that just like, 
is one of the notions that for me summed up the idea of this like it's beyond the hashtag like social media is so much more than just hashtags and discoverability and you know reels and stories it's actually about connecting with people Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you see it as part of that that sales funnel I guess um you know they're called social networks for a reason you know is that network you meet somebody face to face connect with them online then you're receiving their content you're building a relationship with somebody 10 times quicker than you would if you have to then show up to the same networking group once a month every month for the next yeah. year yeah yeah um, it's very true it's very very true because you can't uh, the thing with, with with networking groups they, i mean don't get me wrong they can be great and i and i've used networking groups in my career and they've been fan- fantastic for me but what i've found is that you can only dedicate yourself properly to a very small handful of them so you know, I don't want to spend all day every day in, in networking groups. That would make yeah. me crazy. Um, and I've got work to do. So I think to be able to dip in, you know, we, we're members of Bristol Creative Industries. They're fantastic. Pretty much every time I go along to one of their events, we end up getting a lead from it, which is great. That's not why I go. I go because I genuinely want to connect with other people in, in the creative industries in this area. But I'll go, I, would, I don't have to go to every single one. Um, yeah. I can go occasionally just sort of, you know, to kind of refresh and mostly normally to get inspiration. But then on LinkedIn, that's where I continue that that conversation. Um, and it also fits around my lifestyle. You know, I've, I've got young kids. I can't be at everything. You know, I, I go to the occasional networking event in the evening, but I'm going to one tonight, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I can't I can't do that. I've got to look after my kids. So. Yeah. And instead, social media allows you to, to probably start connecting, keep connecting with people. Yeah. Um, whilst you're at home. Yeah. Ultimately. In your PJs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in your PJs. Um, what's your relationship like with social media personally then? So obviously forms a really vital part of your of your company's strategy, mm-hmm. marketing strategy. But what is it? How do you get on with social personally? I like it. I like it. And, you know, I know that it can have its downsides and its dark sides and people can get obsessed with it and it can be dangerous and all these things. And I, and I do get that. I don't think it's necessarily social media's fault. I think it's sort of how people engage with it. You know, yes. Like guns don't kill people, people do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, or, you know, rappers do, or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, I, I really like it. I think I've always been, I've always been a person that likes to record things. So even from mm-hmm. when I was a little kid, I've always had a diary. Yes. So I love using like Instagram as my online photo album sort of recording the best and I know it's only the best bits of my life of course it's not a real you know if you look at if you look if you look at Instagram my life looks perfect I have a beautiful (laughs) garden and perfect children and I'm baking this does not happen most of the time but obviously I'm not going to record like the mess and the whatever so I quite like it as a way of curating for myself this view of of my life but also the best moments the best moments of your life Yeah. yeah thing is people criticize that go oh it's just a curated view it's like well of course it is back in the day when we just had photos and photo albums nobody was taking photos of the mess and the bad days they were only ever taking photos of the birthday parties and all that stuff so it's not like social media has changed the way that we want to record the good moments that's just that we can do it more easily now yeah so, absolutely yeah. and do you think it's um because there's a lot of discussion actually about um you know really actually opening up your life to people on social media and showing the bad moments um showing people that you know it doesn't have to be all perfect particularly if, particularly if you are building a personal brand what yeah. do you think what do you think about that do you think it's important to show those flaws or I think it's it's so much a sort of a case by case basis yes I definitely think that it's it's important you know I, I, I remember once show, showing a photo showing a photo of my children's um crazy bedroom like when they just messed <laughs> yeah, it I up remember and that. Like, oh my god <laughs> that's insane but I think it's interesting I I think everyone needs to take their own stance on social media because you know some people are comfortable sharing things some people aren't and that's fine you know some people never want to say anything about themselves but they do want to share 40,000 photos of their cat, cats that's yeah. again that's absolutely fine from a business perspective I think the one thing that I'm always careful of is the degree of oversharing and mm. especially oversharing from the place of things not being right I think if you're going through a crisis that's a time to be careful because you're not necessarily in the right frame of mind to be posting something that's going to be sensible later. I feel yeah. like once you've come through something bad, then you can talk. So as an example, 
when I started my business, um, as you know, most people know me know, I was a single mum. I had nine month old twins. It was a crazy time. I was going through a divorce. I didn't make a big deal of that because I really didn't want my clients at the time going, oh, my God, how is she going to do this? Work? How is she going to cope? Yeah. How is she going to cope? We can't we can't not we can't trust her, but we you know, we can't give her work because she's not going to be able to, to meet that. So I didn't really talk about it. And it was only probably, you know, two, three years later, as the business started to kind of really take off and be successful, that I was able to then share that founder story. And the reason I share it is because I want to encourage other mums and particularly single mums to kind of believe in themselves that they can probably yeah. achieve a lot more than they think. But I think if I'd have talked about it then, I wouldn't have had the chance to reflect on it and decide what for me I wanted to share. Mm. You know, so for example, I talk about being a single mom but I don't really talk about my divorce so that's not really appropriate so yeah. you know what I mean it's and, and there's just occasional times where I see somebody posting like I'm in crisis and I think oh or oh, you're going to regret that later and I worry for them that they're just yeah. exposing a little bit too much because it is still a place where a bunch of strangers can see what you're saying so yeah you do, 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 be, be careful. definitely I think a lot of people use it as a tactic don't they to generate engagement um you, yeah. I'm, I'm with you I think there are moments where I go oh I could really write a LinkedIn post about this and this is really gonna you know get some engagement but mm-hmm. actually that's when you take a step back reflect and then create content on the back of it I think the content is so much better yeah. because you can give that reflection on it um yeah I'd much rather read something like I had a crisis this is what I learned from it rather than like yeah. I'm currently in crisis I'm like oh, that's okay. I, I empathize but now I'm not sure if I really want to use your business I'm, I'm talking now in a business context rather than you know on Facebook if you've got your 50 best mates on Facebook you know by all means going I'm having a really rubbish time yeah, with it help, help. yeah you know that and again that's why I think it's an individual basis because it's it's who you are what you're comfortable sharing and what the context is that you're you know sharing for and, and you know obviously if you run a, an anti-bullying charity it's much more appropriate to share stories of when you were bullied than yeah it might be in a different scenario. Exactly. And I think that comes in some comes back to a point that you mentioned earlier about actually what you do in terms of copywriting, mm. asking yourself what's interesting to the reader. Mm. Yeah, what's and like what's interesting, what's going to get people commenting and sharing, what's relevant I, I, as well, I guess. Yeah. I guess that's super and important. Because people don't think of uh, as uh, social media as a place where you can listen, but it really is a great place to listen. Yeah. I mean, when you ask for people's opinions, that's the, that's when you get a lot of engagement on a post. So I love doing that, you know, asking yeah. for people's opinions. And then, yeah, and also celebrating, you know, so we posted yesterday about um, the, the new office and I've had so much engagement in that post. And it's wonderful because it's not promoting my business per se. I mean, I suppose I'm saying, look, we're big enough to have an office, but, it, you know, it, it's not, it was never meant to be a promotional post. It was meant to be genuinely me getting excited and wanting to share. Yeah. And I think people can kind of, sense the heart behind a post as well because I was genuinely sharing from a perspective of yay I'm so excited I want to tell my friends um rather than going oh yes I've got an office aren't I amazing aren't I great because I think that (laughs) would come across in a very different way (laughs) yeah I think that's really really great point then a top tip is about that um honesty and um having a genuine reason to share something and it comes people because people can tell right people can tell if you're being sincere or not or yeah you're inflating something just for social media yeah yeah for sure um so those sorts of celebratory posts work really well for you I think they work well well for a lot of people particularly as um for those who have joined or who have been on a journey with somebody um Mm -hmm. since day one um what other content works well for you guys um do you know, I feel like I should have looked up because um, we, we sort of track, you know, the, the top three posts each month that month that do well. But they they often are. Yeah. Some sort of celebration or, you know, like when we when we talk about something that's going on in the business. So like, you know, the fact yeah. that we're going for B Corp status or, um, you know, when we celebrated uh, last month, you know, five year anniversary of becoming a limited company. So those sorts of things tend to get a lot of engagement, which is really nice. nice. Um, but then also. Um, the educational content as yeah. well so you know we've got a piece of unlike you know persuasive writing with examples and t- you know, tips and techniques with persuasive writing yeah um, you know when to use a capital letter which is a one I do years ago I don't even necessarily think it's that good a post but it was people just you know like oh I really need to know this so, so yeah. I think 
our kind of content strategy has always been around looking at that buyer journey and helping people to move through the buyer journey towards working with us by by helping them make better decisions so if somebody isn't a good fit for us or they we're not a good fit for them helping them to work that out as we go through and kind mm. of direct them to what they do need because you know my, my I'm a big believer in the fact that there is some there's an age you know, there's there's enough clients out there for all of us yeah and there's an agency or a freelancer for every client that's looking yes so actually if our content aims to help people work out okay what is it do I what what do I need what is it that I need uh what's going to be the best way of meeting this you know what solution do I need how do I make a good choice how do I make the right choice for my budget etc 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 so that by the time they're making that decision to work with somebody it's a good decision so yeah aiding and facilitating that decision making process yeah is, is I think I think your um, educational content is brilliant I think it's really oh. like value driven and it's um yeah it, it offers so much to the reader so I wouldn't be surprised that they were some of the some of the best pieces of content that you were sharing and um, how do you plan for it all how do you plan and prep and how do you actually find the time that's a very good question <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have a well so so we had a, we had a sales marketing assistant um Ingrid so she's she's still with us but she's been on maternity leave and since she went on maternity leave Tess joined us as our sales and marketing manager so both of them have helped and, and will continue to help with uh, yep. with content creation so normally what happens is that I'm the sort of primary person on the blog because it's sort of, in a sense, my, my kind of expertise. But actually, you know, Sam contributes a lot as well um, and other people at different times have contributed. Um, so the, the blog is like our foundation. That's where yeah. the kind of base amount of content comes from. Um, and then we just repurpose the heck out of it. Um, so, you know, Tess is excellent at going back through old blog posts that are still relevant, you know, the evergreen content and taking stuff out of, out of that so so yeah so I, I'm sort of like the kind of the, the base and then she'll do that and, and then she'll add on to that so she'll add you know uh, more kind of like in insider insights so she's done like little interviews with the team so we can kind of mm-hmm. share more about the team or talking about our B Corp journey in fact actually it was it was funny because the whole B Corp journey thing we've, we've been talking we had been talking about it for a long time and just kind of going right we just need to press go on it press go and then and then she like put it in the content plan like posting about like we've started our journey we're like right Are we? <laughs> we will <laughs> and so we did and it was great because it kind of galvanized and I think sometimes that's the lovely thing it's like hey what do we want to be putting out there okay well then when that's what we need to be doing yeah so you know like we, we've had a you know our, our company values for a while but we'd never really published it and Tessa's like right we're going to put them out there on social I was like all right I never really thought of that, but okay, that is that is all part Great. of building the picture of our of our agency. And we're bu- we're busy um, going through a website, a new website process. So that will be it will be on our, our new website when that's launched. Um, Wicked, I love that. Look forward to seeing that go live. Um, I see you've been on the reels lately. <laughs> That'll be Tess. Because <laughs> Tess is in her twenties, and I'm in my forties. <laughs> I think it oh, looks so- great. How have you been find how how are you finding them? I mean, they get great engagement. I have no yeah. idea if that engagement is from people who are going to one day buy from us, but I kind of figure it's really not that difficult to do. It's super fun. Um, and again, it's sort of kind of what I was saying with David C. Baker and me being like an advocate, you know, even if the people who are seeing this stuff on, on Instagram aren't the same people who are on LinkedIn, who are our target audience, actually there's a degree to which y- you never know so obviously if we, I wouldn't be spending thousands and thousands of pounds to do it because I don't think it's necessarily going to be that effective in terms of return on investment but because of the relatively low yeah. um, effort the, there was an example of uh, a networking group I used to go to years ago um, called Freelance Mum um, I say years ago well, my business let me going five years <laughs> not that years ago but they're amazing and, and you can take your kids along and so obviously when the twins were little it was, it was perfect um and there was a lady I was chatting to there and she wasn't necessarily particularly in our target audience, but actually her husband worked in an agency. And I didn't really know this at the time, but we ended up working for that agency mm. um, and, and getting a lot of work. In fact, no, it wasn't that he moved. So we didn't work in the agency was at the time, but like a year or two later, he moved and we got loads of work through through that company. Mm. Um, so it was just sort of one of those. I happened to be chatting to her as we were walking our babies around um and then she passed that on to to her husband yeah and up doing that work so you never know you never know and you you have to be putting the content out there in ways that are relevant to experiment 
in order to find out what's working for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's also part of like showcasing your brand personality, I think. You know, there's that one, the one reel that I did where I know, it's the it's the lot, I think it's Emma Thompson or somebody laughing and, and going, yes, yeah. we don't be so ridiculous. But you know, like about tattoos, you know, and, and even though, you know, obviously me having tattoos has got absolutely nothing to do with how good we are as copywriters, it's part of that um personality is who we are as a business. We aren't a bit we aren't stuffy and formal. We are very very good at what we do but we take life in a more fun way you know yeah love that and again I think that's a really great place to to wrap it up because I think that's one of the best ways you can see social media beyond the hashtag it's about representing a personality and showing people what it's like to work with somebody to be friends with somebody and you know people by people so yeah Thanks so much, Rin. Really, really enjoyed having you on the show. Likewise. Always love Anata. Yeah, it was so nice to see you again. Take care. Bye. Bye.